it's tempting to think of CERN as being a 27 kilometre long pipe like this one with a bunch of scientists sitting above it analysing their data. But actually there are 3,000 permanent staff on this site and only 86 of them are research physicists. So there is much more to CERN than meets the eye. And because CERN is all about providing the machinery, providing the infrastructure, people have to come from all over the world to analyse the data. So during the summer months when this place is at its busiest and the beams are running and the collisions are happening, there are 12,000 users coming to use the data. So let's have a look around. What is CERN actually made of? And to house all these visitors, the biggest hotel in Geneva is, of course, here at CERN with a whopping 600 bedrooms. When you arrive at CERN, this is where you first come in. No matter if you're a visitor that's just dropping in quickly or if you have a pre-booked tour. And in fact, you can find information about how to visit CERN in the details of this video or go to the website visit.cern. It's as simple as that. Now, of course, there's a gift shop where you can buy your particle physics magnets and t-shirts to support the work that's done here. And also there's an exhibition called Microcosm. And that's what I'm off to explore now. In the exhibition they have this, which is a cloud chamber. So what you're seeing inside is the evidence of particles coming in and interacting with the gas in this box. And on the wall you can see there are certain tracks laid down by electrons. Alpha particles have a different signature. They're the nuclei of helium atoms and then muons as well coming in. And what I love about cloud chambers is that in principle, they are really simple to make. I mean, you could literally make one at home. What you need is a box which has a saturated alcohol vapor inside. So if you get a piece of felt, soak it in your alcohol, not the kind of alcohol you buy in the shop, specialist alcohol, then that will drip down. The vapor will come down into the box. You need to cool it down. So you could use, uh, for example, some, um, I think if you get some solid carbon dioxide, that would do, or if you have access to liquid nitrogen, seal the box with some blue tack around the edge. Maybe you don't want to do this at home. Do this at work if you work in a science lab, but it's just that simple process that you need to reveal to us the stream of particles that's constantly making its way through our atmosphere from space down to ground level and it's quite beautiful. You may see that on top there's a camera as well and that is taking live pictures of these particles coming in and then projecting it onto the floor so I can literally walk through the tracks of these cosmic particles. If you want, you can see a live feed of this data on the CERN website. We'll put a link for that web page below. But what else can we see here? Well, this is great. This is a piece of the original linear accelerator that was here when CERN opened, and it was used to accelerate protons. The protons come in on the right-hand side, and they move through these so-called drift tubes where electric fields accelerate the particles. And as you go down towards the other end, the drift tubes get fatter, and that's because the protons are moving at faster and faster speeds from the right-hand side down to the left. Then over here on the wall, we have a map of the site itself with the Large Hadron Collider, uh, the SPS accelerator. And if you want to find out more about what's happening in these facilities, we went to the CMS experiment and you can find out what we found out ourselves in our other Cosmic Shambles video. One of the things that we talked about in the CMS Cosmic Shambles video is how the particles that are produced during the collision of the protons are detected. And these are used, these are lead tungsten crystals. And they're remarkable. I mean, they look like pieces of glass. They are transparent, but actually they are metal. And when the particles interact with this material, light is given off, it scintillates, and that light is detected and from that you can work out the energy of the particles that were produced in the collisions. 
Now these are very special crystals and they were created for the CMS experiment. So as I said, they're lead tungsten crystals. Each one takes two days to grow and there are 80,000 of them in the experiment. Now we've been exploring all the areas of CERN but if you do come here and visit then in the microcosm exhibition you can find out plenty of information about the discovery of the Higgs particle which is what CERN is probably most famous for now. This is another kind of detector that's been used here at CERN. It's called a wire chamber. So it does what it says on the tin. Inside you've got rows upon rows of these probably very finely tensioned wires. And this kind of kit was used to discover the W and Z particles, which are the communicators of the weak interaction. And actually that was Nobel Prize winning work carried out here at CERN. This is my favourite corridor so far, not only because it feels so old school, I mean, check out these pipes that run down the length of the corridor, but also because it's here, right here in fact, that Tim Berners-Lee had his office, and it's here that the World Wide Web was born. And later on, I'm going to try and find the next machine, which was the original web server. <laughs> Seems I'll let any old person come give a talk at CERN. Walking around, you really get a sense that this is a self-contained community. There is a corner shop over there, and a bank over there, and a post office over there, and I can see an insurance provider. Everything you need to organise your life and your scientific travels. There are three restaurants on site, two on the Swiss side, but only one on the French side. I'm in the library and of course I can't resist looking at the sun section. Ha! Clearly a very good selection of books. I have no idea if this has been taken out or not. Many of you, when you think about scientists working here at CERN, you might have one person come to mind who is a Cosmic Shambles regular and host of Stargazing Live. Of course, I mean Brian Cox. Turns out that he's very much still part of the fabric of this place and still connected to CERN. <laughs> And it's not just about knowledge generation, it's also about knowledge dissemination and inspiring the next generation of scientists too. So currently I am stood in CERN's school lab and I'm joined by Julia. Julia, come, and come over here. Come Julia on. runs this fantastic facility, but tell me a bit about what school lab is. What's it for? Why did you create this? Yeah, so this wonderful space serves as a hands-on learning laboratory for particle physics for high school students and their teachers from all around the world. So we really want to kind of make CERN's physics and technologies understandable through hands-on experimentation. So the kids can learn a bit about the principles of particle acceleration and detection to understand what they, for example, see when they visit our magnetist facilities. And do you think that by getting the students in to actually do these experiments themselves, they have a deeper learning of the physics? That's actually part of my PhD thesis. So we're also doing research with the students when they do their experiments. And we want to measure, do they really learn something? Do they understand something? Can we increase their interest in physics, especially in particle physics? Can we erase their scientific curiosity? So I see that they learn something. So I'm very happy with the, with the outcomes so far. Well, that's really nice. So it's not just about the activities that happen here. You are generating education research at the same time exactly yeah that's really nice okay so one of the things I wanted to ask you about in here is the cloud chambers because I know that you build them I've just seen yes. one spectacular one over in the microcosm exhibition but I have in mind that they are in principle quite simple to build can you show me what you do yes here? I can show you my favorite cloud chamber which is over here 
So CloudCharm is really the most fascinating experiment and they're super simple to build. <laughs> so this is the uh, frying pan for singles that you can buy at Ikea, for example, or anywhere else, and a beer cup. And this is a particle detector if you add dry ice and isopropyl alcohol. Because I, I had in mind that all I would need to buy is a box, but actually I can raid my kitchen cupboard. Exactly, yeah, start with your kitchen. So this one was from my kitchen. Uh, I don't, yeah. <laughs> so that works really well. You can also, if you like marmalade, um, you can go for a jar of marmalade instead. Or if you have a lot of bookends in your, uh, in your cupboards, then you can use a bookend. Um, it's super simple to build, and I've never seen a cloud jammer not working. Brilliant. So you need to put some alcohol on the piece of uh, felt or even that looks like a Yeah, kitchen that's a kitchen sponge, sponge exactly. Okay. <laughs> yes, you need any kind of thing to store alcohol. I also use paper, just some paper sheets uh, also works. Just anything that kind of serves as a reservoir for the alcohol. Yeah, fantastic. And then you cool it down um, using something like dry ice? Exactly. Yeah, you need to cool it down and you need to reach minus 25 degrees Celsius minimum. Minus, 20, 30, uh, minus 30 degrees Celsius is better, so dry ice is the best option for that. Okay, I know where I can get all of these things from. So actually, I get my dry ice from um, Gatwick Airport because it's used to cool down the food that's transported on the aircraft. So normally I use it to build comets, but I'm going to give it a go with the cloud chamber. So brilliant. Yes. Okay, well, let's take a look at something else. And because obviously, you know, you've got the particle physics, but you've got the acceleration of the particles that is the fundamental business here. How do you go about demonstrating that to the students? Yes, one thing that surprises students always is that we use magnets not only to bend protons in our accelerator to keep them on a circular path. We also use a lot of magnets in our detectors. So magnets are kind of a... Yeah, you can find magnets everywhere, it's so super important. So one idea we had to introduce how we use magnetic fields to kind of bend particles in the field is to 3D print a model of a toroidal magnet that is used in the Atlas okay. experiment. Okay, can you show me one? Yes, so it's over there. Okay, I'm very interested in magnetic fields. Ah. So it's, a lot of the work I do is based around magnetic fields. And okay, so yeah. here we have... So, tell me about exactly, this, this is our... Um, yeah, this is a model of the Atlas, one of the Atlas magnets, electromagnets. The real magnet is 100 times bigger, so we had to scale it down to print it with our <laughs> uh, beautiful 3D printer over there. And it's printed in several parts and we glued it together. We had two students, two interns, and they had to do 80 windings of copper wire on, mm. on the coils. That yeah, took them a few, few days. But now if you plug it in, if you have a power supply, 12 volt power supply or just battery pack, uh, you can produce a nice magnetic field, and the shape of a magnetic field really looks like the shape uh, of the real Atlas magnet. That is so, so fantastic. So you're making, this is um, a solenoid, is that right, with the so windings? One would be a solenoid if you put uh, them together and you have a donut-shaped magnetic field afterwards, so they will, the magnetic fields would add up to something like this, mm -hmm. you know, like a ring magnetic field lines, then you call it a toroid. Okay. Uh, and the real Atlas has a solenoid in addition in the center, so it's quite, a, it's quite a complex setup, isn't it? But then how do you go about getting the students to visualize the magnetic field that's created within this structure? Is there a way, do you take a compass or something? Yes, 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 exactly. So together with the model, we've printed a 3D compass. So normal compass have the problem, you can't measure 3D fields, but there are ways to kind of put a magnetic needle in a way that it can rotate freely. So you have a 3D compass, uh, you can also 3D print one if you have a small magnet, and then they can kind of dive the, the probe into the magnetic field, and then we'll see how the field lines look like. So the idea is that they really use this to visualize the field using field lines, what they learn in high school. Uh, they can also use their smartphones to get a, yeah, a number of value for the strength of the magnetic field with all the sensors, or if you're more advanced, you can buy hall probes to, to measure the field a bit more precisely. Yeah, that's really nice. And I think you mentioned while you were talking that you get students who are working here involved in these activities. So d do ideas come from the scientists who are working here? Do, do they help with the education projects? Uh, yes, of course. So sometimes, so also here, when we were planned to design it, we first contacted our contacts at Atlas and said, can you tell us a bit more about your magnet? Uh, what, what do we need to do if we want to build a magnet? And we have fantastic volunteers who facilitate all the workshops in here, so it's not us doing all the work, but we have great uh, CERN people joining us, uh, spending time with high school students from the experiments or from the beams department, from IT. They all love to communicate science, and then, so they come to us to do that. 
It's great. I mean, it is an amazing facility, and I would encourage school groups to check this out. They are free visits. Can you believe it? It's free to come here. You just have to cover your costs of the transport and the accommodation. If you want to find out more, there are websites on the CERN or off of the CERN main website, and the URL is up there on the board. Basically, do a search for CERN School. Yesterday I went to see the CMS experiment which is around nine kilometres from the spot I'm standing on now because today I've come to see this. This is Atlas. Now Atlas and CMS can be viewed as sibling experiments. They both played a vital role in the detection of the Higgs boson and they are multi-purpose particle accelerators and particle experiments. Size-wise Atlas is quite substantial. It is 26 six metres high and 46 metres long. So that's around twice as long and twice as high as CMS. But the scientists here have told me proudly that it is a low density experiment. So even though it has a large volume, it has a mass only around half of that of CMS. But anyway, it's huge in size, hence the very large building that sits on top of Atlas, which is buried 100 metres below ground. This is the facility with perhaps the best name at CERN. I'm standing in an antimatter factory. Now, antiprotons are made in collisions outside of this building. Then they are separated off and brought into a circuit that runs the whole way around the building and that slows the speed of the antiprotons down. Now, the reason that that happens is because it's only at lower energies that you can do something useful with these antiparticles. For example, combine them with anti-electrons. And that's what they do in here. So bringing these two particles together to make anti-hydrogen, anti-matter, they are literally building it in here. And what you can see behind me here is one of the newest experiments that they have. And this is called Elena. It's not yet completed, so it's not yet covered with um, slabs of concrete, as you can see uh, in other locations here. But uh, yeah, this place is completely unique. It is the only facility of its kind making antimatter in the world. CERN also has its own carpool facility and bike hire service. Well, I say bike hire, actually both the cars and the bicycles are free for people who work on this site to use because it is an enormous site. It takes a long time to walk from one end to the other. Um, just up the road from me is the fire brigade service and then I am stood directly outside at the medical facility. Now, I've been told that there have been no major medical emergencies on this site, but actually it makes sense to have this here because in some of the experiments, pieces of the equipment might become radioactive and if people are near them or handling the material you need to be monitored for any doses that you might pick up so through a dosimeter and then having regular blood tests so there's a very very small risk but it just goes to show you've got to have good health and safety measures in place um, but get this when it comes to the police the police cannot just come onto this site without being invited because we are neither in France nor Switzerland. This is an independent international organisation and the police have to be invited onto the site. OK, I'm coming to the edge of the site of CERN now. Behind me you can see uh, LINAC4, which is the latest linear accelerator. That's actually not yet operational. Now, when I started speaking to camera, I started off in France and now I'm in Switzerland. So this stone here marks the boundary between the two countries and it's very symbolic of the fact that this is a very international place. CERN has 22 member states and it relies on big international collaborations. Big science, big scientific questions need big research groups. We need skills from all around the world different areas of expertise, different attitudes, approaches. That's what's absolutely fundamental and vital to making big steps forward in science. And I think that the fact that you can cross the border here so easily is representative of the situation that we need in science. We need a free flow of minds between different areas and between different countries. So big science needs big international collaborations and CERN has it spot on.
I've come inside the globe of science and innovation and this is another free exhibition that you can come and see if you visit CERN. And you might be thinking, well, what is the innovation of CERN and of science in general? And as a taxpayer, it's a completely natural question to ask. What does the person on the street benefit from this Blue Skies research? Well, the thing about Blue Skies research is that you don't know what's going to happen until the discovery or the development was made. And there's one particular development that was made at CERN which every single person watching this video will use, and that is the World Wide Web. And in this exhibition, in here, you can come and see the very first World Wide Web server as developed and as used by Tim Berners-Lee. And off to the right-hand side is a copy of the proposal that he wrote at the time, and his supervisor has written on the top, vague, but exciting. Well, I hope you have enjoyed this somewhat whirlwind tour of sight and the many facets of the work that go on here, not just arts, but science projects too. And there is so much more to what I've shown you. It's not just about CMS and Atlas and the hunt for the Higgs boson. For example, I haven't had a chance to show you the site where they're measuring or trying to understand the origins of spin of the proton, for example. And then there are instruments that are designed and built here, which are now in space on the International Space Station, where they're hoping to understand what the elusive dark matter is made of, and perhaps even detect an antimatter particle, for example, an anti alpha particle that would show scientists that antimatter can exist in a stable configuration out in the cosmos. But of course it's also about the next generation and a great way that young people and schools can get involved in the work here is to take part in the Beamline for Schools competition. What you need to do is submit your ideas for research that you would like to carry out here using the beam here. So submit your ideas and if you are chosen, your school could be here carrying out your science experiments and discovering your new contribution in particle physics.